Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Revelation 19, 7 and 9. This morning's lesson is entitled, Invited. It's got an exclamation point, so you say it loud. Invited. I printed up some invitation cards in the back. I hope everyone got it, got a copy. If, uh, if not, there's, I saw some extras still in the back. In that card, it contains the outline for this morning's lesson. And I would encourage you to hold on to that, as for next Sunday morning, we're going to be talking about the last two items on that uh, invitation card and a little more detail next week. What I want to do this morning is do kind of an overview of the invitation. What a joyous occasion a marriage is. What a wonderful occasion having a wedding is. It is an occasion of great joy and praise and thanksgiving. There are scenes painted for us in the New Testament and a couple different passages that paint for us this idea that there's an eternal marriage that's going to happen and that we as Christians are not only invited, but we are the participant. We are part of the wedding party. And that is found in the first one we're going to look at this morning is in Revelation 19, 7 to 9. In Revelation 19, 7 to 9. And you might ask why the, the bride holding a sword. I want you to remember, as we've been talking about on our role as a disciple on Wednesday nights, the bride is a warrior bride. The church is a soldier. The church is to put on the whole armor of God. Therefore, the bride of Christ is a warrior bride. In Revelation 19, 7 and 9 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. What he says is his bride has made herself ready. How do we know this is the church? How do we know this isn't some figurative or symbolic language talking about something that we can never understand, we're never going to come to terms with, as is so many things in Revelation when you talk with other people. We all seem to have an opinion of what it's talking about. How do we know here he's talking about an eternal scene of the marriage between the Lamb, who is Christ, and the church? I want you to place a marker here as we'll come back to it. And I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading in verse 25. Really, the full context here goes back to verse 22. And it, he's talking about the roles in the marriage, in the physical sense, so the roles of the wife, the roles of the husband towards one another. And intermixed with these roles, he's telling us how we can understand the role of the church to Christ by understanding the role of the marriage relationship in the physical sense. So even in the marriage relationship, in the physical sense, God designed it to point to something spiritual. So then we would know how the proper relationship between the church and Christ is to function by understanding the proper roles of husbands and wives in the home. And we know this from verse 32. We're going to read that in just a second. So look with me in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Isn't that what we read in Revelation 19? It says the church, the bride has made herself ready. It was given her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And it tells us what the fine linen is. It doesn't leave it up to our interpretation, our imagination. It says the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In, verse, in Ephesians 5, if you're still there re reading with me, in verse 27, that he's going to present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. It paints for this picture of us as the bride, wearing the white garment symbolizing purity. And in verse 32... Over and over here, he talks about the roles of the wives, he talks about the roles of the husbands, and then intersperses that with the role of Christ as the head of the church, and the church to be submissive to Christ. In verse 32, he tells us why. He says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. 
He says why he's going back and talking about the roles of the relationship in the physical home so that we might know the spiritual implication of that. There's a spiritual truth taught there between the church and Christ. Also, look with me in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. If Ephesians 5 wasn't enough to show us the correlation between the marriage relationship between a husband and wife and the church and Christ, notice what Paul says in the terms that he uses in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2 to describe the saints at Corinth. He says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. What he's saying is they were betrothed to deity. That's the idea there. They're betrothed to deity. As they were as saints of God, as we can see in chapter 1, as saints today, we too are betrothed to deity. These pictures that we have for us as the bridegroom and the bride, Jesus being the bridegroom, the bride being the church, it paints for this eternal scene of immense joy and gladness. And the angel wrote, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it might ask, uh, cause us to wonder, well, who's invited? It's an honor to receive an invitation. It's an honor to receive an invitation to something. It, it, you, you hold it and you say, wow, that's awesome. I can't wait to participate in it. I can't wait to go. It's an honor to be invited. But who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. This is often referred to as the parable of the marriage feast. From the New King James in verse 4, this is where we get the phrase, all things are ready. We sing a hymn that says, all things are ready. Come to the feast. Come to the table that is now spread. Jesus told this parable of the marriage feast. And while sometimes, I, I can't speak for you, but I can't speak for me. Oftentimes when I think of this parable, I often think of the people that rejected it and were murdered, the people that were then sent to bring in everybody from the highways and the person that was punished at the end because they weren't dressed right. And while those are all part of that and true, I think if we only focus on those things, we're missing the big picture. The big picture here is a celebration. The big picture here is one of, of great, immense gladness and joy that we are called to be a part of. Read with me, starting in Matthew 22, starting in verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. Here were those who were invited. This was an honor to come to the table of the king. And it says, verse 3, And they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, So he hadn't given up on those people. This was a huge honor. He says, tell those who've been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. Or as New King James reads, all things are ready. My oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. So some said, no, I have more important things to attend to. I have more important things to get done. It's, it's just this day is business as usual, despite the, the fact that this was a huge honor happening at the king's table, where it was the marriage feast for his son. But verse 6 says, And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him in the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. There is a lot to glean from this parable. Those who were invited were not prepared. They made excuses not to come. They mistreated and killed the servants that were, fetched, that were sent to fetch them. 
when Jesus is telling this parable, well, they might not have fully understood it. Later on in John 16, 13, he says he's going to send the Holy Spirit, that once he's gone, the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. And later on, even after he was raised from the dead, it says they remembered the things he said while he was with them. The Holy Spirit was going to bring to their remembrance everything that he taught. And so having the completed word of God is having this hindsight vision of being 2020. We can see and look at what he said that they might not have understood then and understand fully now what he's talking about. He's talking about the Jews who killed the prophets. He's talking about the Jews who ultimately would put the prince to death. The Jews rejected Christ in Acts 2, in verse 22 through 23, and verse 36. Peter says they delivered him over. They had him put to death at the hands of godless men. In verse 36, he says, this, this Christ, whom, G has, whom God has made both Christ and Lord, he says this Jesus, whom Christ has made both Christ and God has made both Christ and Lord, you have crucified. They rejected Jesus. Then it says the king's going to destroy the murderers and send his servants to fetch any and all to his son's marriage feast. In Luke 21, verse 20, Jesus foretold A.D. 70 would happen, that Jerusalem would be destroyed. He foretold in another place that not one stone would stand upon another when it came to the temple. And in Luke 21, verse 20, he said, when you see the armies encircling the city, know that the desolation is near. She's about to lose her country. She's about to lose her identity and nationality and her religion. 70 AD's destruction was so complete that Jews today don't know what tribe they're from, and therefore they don't have priests. There is no one that can do sacrifices even if they wanted to, because they lost their identity in AD 70. They lost their religion for all intents and purposes in AD 70. They were destroyed. And he's talking about the Gentiles into the church. Go and fetch any good and bad. Bring them into the marriage feast. In John 10, in verse 16, as Jesus was talking about the idea he is the good shepherd, he says in verse 16 that there are others of his flock that he needs to bring into the fold. He's speaking about the Gentiles, not just the Jews. He was foretelling a time, just as Isaiah foretold in Isaiah 2 and 1 to 2, when he says all people will come to the Mount of Zion, fulfilled in the day of Pentecost, Zion being Jerusalem. Jesus said, there's others sheep that I have to bring into the fold before this is over. In Acts chapter 10 and 11, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And when the Jews take him to task in Acts chapter 11, and he recounts by his own words what happened. And when he gets to the part that the Holy Spirit signified that they could have repentance leading to life, says the Jews rejoiced. They rejoiced. The Gentiles were brought into the fold. We look in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Paul said to the Jews there in Acts 13, 46, You've judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. I'm going now to the Gentiles. In Ephesians 2, 13 to 16, we're told that the blood of Christ reconciled Jew and Gentile, man to man, and put them all in one new body and reconciled that body to God. His blood reconciled man to man and man to God. Ephesians 3, 4 through 6, he says the mystery of Christ is that he brought Jew and Gentile together into the body of the church. Jesus foretold all of this in this parable. That they that judge themselves unworthy of the invitation were going to be ultimately destroyed. And his servants went in to fetch all those that they found. So who's invited? Everyone. Everyone, the good and the bad, were invited. But there was something that required, wasn't there? A man showed up unprepared and not dressed for the occasion, befitting the honor that was owed. He did not show up in wedding clothes. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9, tells us that when Jesus returns, he's going to deal out vengeance or retribution to those who do not know God. And those who have never obeyed the gospel. And verse 9 says they will be eternally separated. Revelation 19.8 tells us what the wedding garment is, didn't it? If you go back to Revelation, if you go back to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8, where it says, 
bright and clean garments was given for her to wear, and that was the righteous acts of the saints. There is something required of the invitee to wear. In Matthew 22 and verse 14, he says, For many are called, but few are chosen. What a huge honor it is to be one of those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The angel said, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So if you look at that wedding card before you, if you've gotten one, we are invited, but to what? The marriage of the Lamb to the church. Revelation 19, 7 and 9. Matthew 22, 1 to 4, as we just read. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Saints are betrothed to deity. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 and verse 32, as we've already read. This is going to take place in that last day. It's an eternal celebration. And we are invited to participate. The who? Who is invited? All mankind, as we just read. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so that those that believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He died for all the world. All were invited. In Matthew 11, 28-30, we often call this the invitation of Christ because he says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There are people today that think that there's a rest promised in this life. No, he says, Jesus says, Follow me, I will give you rest. He is the giver of the ultimate eternal rest. This is not going to be found here on earth. Jesus says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my burden is light. In Matthew chapter 22, 9 to 10, as we read here in the parable, as they went into the highways and the byways and they brought everyone in, Christ's blood was shed for all mankind, all the world. The invitation is extended to all who will come. Look with me in Revelation 22 and verse 17. In Revelation 22 and verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Who is the bride? The bride is the church. The bride is made up of the saints, of the Christians, of the children of God that are in the church. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's the invitation. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. We have a free will to choose. We have a free will to choose to accept that invitation or to reject it. Just as those who were form formerly invited, the Jews only, and they rejected it. And then all were called to that marriage feast. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the power of salvation to the Jew first and to the Greek, to the Gentiles. The power of the gospel is to go to all men, to the Jew and the Gentile. When? When is the marriage feast of the Lamb? Matthew 24 and verse 36 tells us that it's a time that only God knows. He says, not even the Son knows the day and the hour, but God alone. I want you to look with me in Matthew 25 and verse 13. Here is another parable given of the marriage feast. It kind of portrays a little bit more of the Jewish tradition of how marriages were done or betrothals. Jewish tradition tells us that when a man and, and woman were betrothed to be married, the man would go away to build a home, usually with the help of his father or near his father's land, and depending on the circumstances, that could change, but he went away to prepare a home. The bride didn't ever really know when he was coming back to get her. She and her wedding party had to be prepared. So when he came again, and they saw him coming, there would be a huge party in the streets. There would be a huge feast, and the bride and her wedding party would go out, and they would meet him. And the marriage feast would commence, and usually it lasted about a week. Jesus kind of alludes to this when he gives this parable in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent, or wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise or the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you two. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And then here's the moral of the parable. Verse 13. Jesus says, Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. See, the bridegroom has gone to prepare a home. And the bride is to make herself ready. And we're to be alert and watchful, waiting for his return. So many passages tell us that we're to be alert and watchful for his return. In John chapter 14, he tells his disciples, I'm going away. But if I go away, it's to prepare a home for you. And if it's to prepare a home for you, that means I'm coming back one day to get you that where I am, you will always be. Again, that, that idea of the bridegroom coming to get the bride. And that there will be this marriage feast of the king's son to his bride. And the bride ought to be presented to him pure. As Paul said to the saints at Corinth, he betrothed them to deity. And he wanted to present them to Christ as a pure virgin. So the when, only God knows when. When Christ is ready for judgment day to begin. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18 tells us there will be a shout. The trumpet of God will sound. The dead in Christ will rise. And then those who are alive will meet him in the air. He won't step foot on this earth. That invitation is for us to meet him in the clouds. To go to that home that he has gone to prepare. And 2 Peter 3, 9 to 12 says, The world is going to burn up. He takes out any mystery that we might have as to the end of the world. It'll be burn up with intense heat that all the elements that we know will melt. But he says, you knowing these things, what sort of people ought you to be in holy and godly conduct? Looking for and hastening the day of God. Why? Because as the bride, we're to make ready. We're to be looking for the bridegroom to come and not be caught off guard as the foolish virgins, but to be those of the wise who are waiting for that time, no matter what the hour might be. In 1 Thessalonians 5.2, the wind will be like a thief in the night. And so saints are to keep watch and be praying. And where is this invitation? Where is the marriage of the Lamb to the church going to take place? Not on earth. It'll take place in heaven. Matthew 25, 31-34. The king will come and call all nations to himself. He's going to separate them out as sheep and goats, sheep to the right, goats to the left. And then judgment will commence. And he'll say to those on his right hand in verse 34, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He'll say to those on his left in verse 41, depart from me, I never knew you. You were cursed once. And they'll be tossed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46 calls it eternal punishment and eternal life for the righteous. Revelation 19.5 is the scene before the throne of God in heaven. And Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15. John had the privilege of seeing this vision that Jesus talked about in Matthew 25 take place where the small and the great were gathered before a great white throne and judgment was read from the books according to their deeds. And if their name was not found in the book of life, they suffered the second death. It is very important that our names are recorded in that book of life. 1 Peter 1.4 says we have a reservation in heaven for our souls. A reservation that will never fade away. It's not not something perishable like, like we see here on earth. This is an eternal invitation. It's one of great joy and gladness. The marriage of the Lamb to the church, all mankind is invited to a time that only God knows when, so we are to be prepared, and it will take place in heaven. We're going to spend next week talking in more detail about these these two, so I want to touch on these briefly. The attire is not optional. Notice that the attire to this marriage feast is required, and it is fine, bright. King James uses the word white and clean linen. New American uses the word bright from the Greek word that means radiant. It's this idea of shining light, radiant. Ephesians 4.24 says we're to put on the new self. We spent last month a couple weeks talking about things we're to lay aside and things we're to put on. 
We're to lay aside wickedness. We're to lay aside that old self, Ephesians 4.22. We're to put on the new self. We're to put on compassion and love in Colossians 3, 12 to 14. We are to put on Christ, it simply says in Romans 13 and verse 14. Ephesians 5, 26 to 27, we read this a little earlier. We'll read it again. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 26 and verse 27. In talking about the church being presented to Christ, he says, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Revelation 19.8 talked about that. It's the righteous acts of the saints. That is holy and blameless conduct. In Philippians 2 and verse 15, Paul says of the Philippians, they were acting as lights. And he says they need to be lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation to be above reproach. 2 Peter 3.11, knowing what, what will happen at the end time. He says, what kind of people ought you to be in holy and godly conduct, looking for and hastening that day? All of these things speak about the righteous acts of the saints, how we are to be attired. And then the parable of the marriage feast, we understand that when he called the good and the bad, they could not go through the feast being bad. They had to change. They had to put on the wedding clothes, the bright and fine linen. They had to put on the righteous acts of the saints. Galatians 3, 26 to 27 tells us when we are baptized, we're baptized into Christ and being baptized into Christ, we clothe ourselves with Christ. How do we come to the marriage feast? What is the proper required attire? To be clothed with Christ. Titus 2, 11 to 14 says we're to no longer live worldly, we're to deny ungodly desires. He says we are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. We are to put on the required attire to attend this marriage feast of the Lamb and the church. And we're to RSVP. Any invitation usually requires an RSVP, so they can do a head count. They know who to prepare for. How do we RSVP? We're going to spend some time talking about that next week as well, but really what it's talking about is obedience to the gospel. We need to be obedient to the gospel. Galatians 3, 26 to 27. I quoted it earlier. I want you to read it with me. And see that this RSVP is how we become the spiritual heirs of Abraham. He says in verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Verse 28, we're going to read through verse 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, how do we belong to Christ? I refer you back to verse 27. When we are baptized into Christ and put him on as a garment, it says. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. He's saying the church became spiritual Israel. We are those descendants. We are the promised heirs of that promise made to Abraham going back to Genesis 12 and verse 3. It was fulfilled in Jesus. So how do we RSVP? How do we reserve the place at the table? Through obedience to the gospel. Ephesians 5.23 tells us the importance of being baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 tells us we're baptized into the body, the body being the church. I want you to look in Ephesians 5.23 and see the importance of being in the body, the church. It says, and again, using the marriage relationship, verse 32 says he's giving it so we can understand the role between the church and Christ. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. He has not promised to save any other body. He has promised to save the church. He has promised to save his body, the body of which he is the head. We need to be in that body in order to be saved. Hebrews 5.9 says, Jesus saves those who obey him. He becomes the source of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Not claim that they love him. Not claim that they've obeyed him. Not run around saying, I know him. He's the source of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Remember Matthew 22, verse 14? Many are called, but few are chosen. 
God has called everyone. In Matthew 7, 13 to 14, he uses it, he gives it in a different way. He says there's two roads or two gates. A broad gate that'll lead to destruction and a narrow gate that leads to life. It's not that those on the broad gate don't know and can't find that narrow gate. It's they choose not to. Because the broad gate's easier. Well, that's where the party is. That's where all my friends and family are. We want our friends and family to be on the narrow gate. He says, few there are that find it, but it will lead to life. So when he says in Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. It's the few who are willing to change from the garments of the world, stained with sin, and put on the bright, clean, and radiant garments of the bride. But Matthew 25, 21, and 23 tell us it's an eternity of joy with our master will commence. Look with me in Matthew 25 as we close. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, starting in verse 21. This is after talking about the parable of the talents. Again, likening the kingdom of heaven to this. He says in verse 21, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Again in verse 23, his master said to him, this is the one that received two talents. The first one was the one that got five. He says now to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. This is a joyous occasion that we're talking about here, that we are invited to participate in. God has made preparation. He has said all things are ready. He has said come to the feast. It is for us to hear that invitation, to hear it, to know it, and to obey it. This, way, this morning, if you're not a Christian, you will be found unprepared. Just as the foolish virgins who left their oil behind and were left out of the marriage feast, if you're not a Christian, when he comes again, you will be left unprepared and left outside the door. For once it is shut, it is shut. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9 says, don't be one of those that don't know God. Don't be one of those who have never obeyed the gospel. You can choose to be one of the chosen. You can choose to be one of the few after having heard the word of God and choosing to obey it. You can repent and be baptized today. If you are a Christian this morning, not living the way that you should, perhaps not being prepared for his coming. If he were to come now and the marriage feast is called, would you be ready? Would you be found in the garments that you need to be wearing? If the answer to that is no, you need to make correction too. You can repent of your sins and be renewed and stay on the alert. If we can assist you in anything, if you're a subject to the invitation of Christ in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.